Okay, good morning. Um, it's Monday, it's 8.30 in Los Angeles, which means it must be time for me and Sharon to start chatting about grief. Hey, Sharon, how you doing? Good morning, Andrew. How are you on this Monday? Gloomy Monday, actually, here. Gloomy down, down by the ocean? Yeah, it's all overcast. I mean, it's so different than it was yesterday and Saturday, where it was beautifully sunny and no clouds. Today, it's like foggy. That June gloom stuff, you know, we always get. Forget about that. I forget about that in, in L.A. Um, it's beautiful and sunny here in the valley. Um, it's blue skies. The birds are tweeting. It's a stunning, you know, um, I love this time of year. It's the uh, spring and autumn. Perfect time to come and visit Los Angeles. So today, um, I mean, we're a music um, channel. And even though um, music is focused on the, the idea of grief, um, Avicii, super popular. I think he was 29. Tim Bergling died um, last week. And he was, a, if you're not familiar, he was a huge um, presence in the EDM world, had this massive crossover hit, Wake Me Up. And the, the outpouring from everybody is, it seems that he was genuinely a super cool, nice guy, you know, from all the people. But what I want to talk about today is this idea of, of celebrity grief, because I know, I mean, nowadays, was it like this? You know, I mean, it wasn't like this 30, 40 years ago, was it, when somebody died or was it? I mean, do you remember, do you see any differences, Sharon? You know, it's hard to say because I remember, because I'm significantly older, I remember like when Elvis died and I mean, it was huge. I think I was with one of my friends. I was still in high school. I was with one of my friends at like Knott's Berry Farm or something and it was like over the PA system. So, I mean, we didn't have social media and stuff, but I think... You know, we use the old fashioned way of people called each other and, and, you know, whatever. So, I mean, it's hard to say. I think it's more it's more prevalent because of social media now. Um, so, you know, you see it everywhere, you know, so you can't really miss it. It's kind of funny. There's been days where I've been busy working and something pops up and you're like, how did I miss that? You know, but um, I think I think it's relative for the times, if that makes sense. It's, I mean, I, I remember when Elvis died. I remember when John Lennon died, and that was, uh, that was another huge shock. Um, and I was at school at the time, but there was a, there were mass, there were marches in New York City, weren't there? Right, and vigils and people leaving flowers. And uh, I mean, it was like huge from what I remember. But then we were watching it. I was in college when John Lennon died. We were watching that in, on TV. Right. Yeah. yeah. So there was John Lennon. Um, I mean, the, the assassinations and Kennedy and JFK, that's a whole different thing. And I, I guess the John Lennon was an assassination, but there's that difference between political and, you know, sort of musical, so, you know, the celebrity types. So then the next one that kind of stunned me and knocked me back and then made me question it was um, Princess Diana. Mm. So I was... Um, I was working in London at the time um, in the offices in Baker Street, which is you know pretty much slap bang in the middle of London. Mm -hmm. And Diana died over the weekend. And there seemed to be this sea change. Um, there was this almost you know country wide grief. It was as if the country was getting together to um, to grieve, and it seemed to be infectious. Because, you know, one person would have it really bad and they would pass it on to the next person. And the flowers in, you know, outside Kensington Palace House, the centre of London smelled like mm. a flower shop. It was amazing. And here's the thing, for me, I didn't get it. And it wasn't that I didn't appreciate who she was, because she was an incredible human being. And, you know, she did a, a, an awful lot for, I mean, the way she brought her children up and the way she challenged the institutions. I mean, just a, a, an amazing. But there was this, it, it, it almost crossed, not crossed the Rubicon, but it almost, I mean, jumped the shark, I think is the expression I'm looking for. And there seemed to be, I don't know, some of it didn't seem sincere. It seemed like everybody was going, let's get on this grief bandwagon. But I, what does that sound like to you? Was I just being odd? I mean, 
No, no, I don't think so at all. And I think what happens is when somebody in the public eye, whether it's a musician or a celebrity or whatever, dies, there's a number of things that happen, it's, especially if the person was a musician and you think about Whitney Houston and Prince. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. You know, you think back to all those songs of theirs that you used to listen to. And so it evokes all those memories. And in some cases, not only are you grieving for the person and their death and whatever, but you're grieving for all, maybe, you know, Whitney's song was like your breakup song, right? And so now that song is with you and you're grieving for that loss as well. And so I think what happens with a lot of the grief in the public eye <clears throat> is that people's, because grief is cumulative, if you haven't necessarily dealt with your own losses, it's almost like giving you permission. Not only are you crying for Prince, because I was I was a mess when Princess Diana died. I mean, I was up at O Dark 30 for her funeral. I mean, we were about the same age. I mean, we had our kids about the same time. You felt like you could relate to her. And so there was all of that. But then there was this, you know, I think subconsciously all the losses that you've experienced in your own life come forward with the grief as well. So maybe people weren't necessarily, you know, being, quote unquote, honest about how they felt about Diana, but maybe they were being honest about, you know, that boyfriend they broke up with or that mother that died. It just it brought everything forward and it gave them permission to grieve because that's what we need permission, it seems like. And to be able to grieve in community is so very healing. So the tears could have been for Diana or could have been for their mom or their grandma or for the boyfriend they lost or the divorce that, you know, that kind of thing. So there's those two things happen, I think, when we're going through kind of those celebrity, um, those celebrity deaths. I mean, there's two points for me to pull out of that. I mean, there's one, there's the association. Absolutely, you're right. I mean, if it's a musician, it's a song and you're, you know, that artist is associated with a particular, you know, part of your own past and, and grief history. That, I think that's a, that's a really solid point. But the, the bigger one that resonates more deeply with me is this idea of community grief, because you're right. Grief is this, you know, isolated thing that you tend to go through on your own. Nobody understood me when I went through my grief, etc. But the ability to grieve as a group, and you're right, because people get together, don't they? I mean, when Diana died, we lived in a, I was living in this tiny little village, you know, 40 miles north of London. And, you know, a real old traditional, you know, three pubs in the main street and a church tower. And, you know, there was a shrine to her and people would go there. And I think in the same way that laughter is infectious, mm -hmm. tears and, and grieving is infectious too. And that there was, it just seemed like this cathartic, brilliant experience for people. Right, because you're being given permission. I mean, if you talk to people who, you know, my significant other, John, they did not have a funeral for him. And in some ways I felt robbed um, because I felt like I needed to grieve with his family and publicly and all of that. And so I think, you know, again, it goes back to the fact that when we can grieve together, it makes it okay to cry. You know, normally you don't walk down the street crying or people think you're crazy. But when you're grieving with other people, sometimes who you don't know, it's that humanity, right? You know, the humanity comes out, the tears come out, everybody's crying. It like, it, it gives you permission um, because otherwise we don't give ourselves permission to grieve. And when you can do it together, there's such a healing that occurs. I mean, the same thing happened after 9-11, right? In a lot of ways. I was in DC working in Washington, DC then. I mean, talk about grief in the workplace, everywhere you went. I mean, our community, the planes weren't taking off at Dulles or anything. And we just, everybody walked around crying and it was like, we needed that. It was okay. You know, it was like, you know, we need to do this together. And um, I think that's the healing part is grieving in community rather than grieving alone. I think that's huge. I love these conversations because I mean, <laughs> we go into them with no script, but just an idea. And I love how, you know, just from the dialogue, I mean, just for me selfishly, you know, to take away the idea of the power of you know, grieving with others, the power of grieving as a community, because I'm going to, and that's changed my perspective on it, which is what life is about, isn't it? <laughs> right, right. 
And that's why funerals and memorial services and, you know, um, Barbara Bush was on. My mom was watching that the other day. I mean, that was very heartfelt. And, um, you know, I think having those things and making it more of the mainstream reminds us that we have every right to be sad no matter who it is. Right. No matter who it is. And Avicii, not only was he so young, I mean, my my kids are that age. Um, but his music, I mean, I knew his music, so it, it, it reached across boundaries. And, and even as a young person, you know, he, he struggled with his fame. I mean, it wasn't easy for him. So, you know, it's heartbreaking. I mean, I cry just thinking, you know, about how old he was. And then you think about all the music that, that he was able to create and touch other people with. It's just, you know, it's really cool. I mean, the, you know, we've got about 42 lists active on Music2 and, you know, at least two of the curators have sent in an Avicii track this week and I'm actually, it's going to be one of those tracks that will go out onto the Grief2 list because it's like true fans know his catalogue and sure, you know, we've got Wake Me Up as one of the tracks but there's this beautiful track that came in from one of the curators that I'd never heard of before and it's just, it's the perfect track because he seemed like a I mean, he took two years off and he was dealing with anxiety and all that. I mean, yeah, it's that's a whole different um, topic about, you know, the, the challenge of being successful and certainly the creative challenges. And, you know, it goes back to that Elizabeth Gilbert you know, discussion that we were having about how so many of our creative geniuses now stick a Vinci in there, you know, die early and tormented and, how the hell does that happen? Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, we can relate also to the fact that he was human. He, he wasn't really, you know, this deity, you know, he created gorgeous music and all of that. So obviously he was a gifted, talented man, but he was also human. You know, he had struggles and issues like we all do. And I think that's why people can relate, um, especially with, younger musicians who are more vocal maybe about the struggles that they're going through. And since nobody has that perfect, you know, that perfect life, you know, people can so relate to that. You know, it's cool, isn't it? I mean, I'm, we're now completely going off tangent, but it's when you looked at social media when it first came in, and I think it was about a year ago, maybe two years ago, and Instagram was probably the worst culprit on this, but you know, I was writing when I was doing my consulting business that social media is your perfect life. Yeah, it's what people as aspire to. That that one time where they manage to get into a high end restaurant or whatever, they take the snap and they post it, and that and people think, my God, that's what they do all the time. But it's not. It's aspirational, and and that was driving a lot of the. I mean, there's a lot of data out there that social media is damaging to self-esteem for teens and, you know, even the younger kids coming in because they see all this amazing stuff and think they've got to be there. But now you've got the fake news thing and Facebook coming in. It's beginning to change. And the upside of social media where people actually start sharing their truths, that gives me massive hope for the future. No, absolutely. And I, I can, I'll never forget. And this is a few years ago. Demi Lovato lost her dog. Her dog died. And one of her dogs, I think she's lost several, but this was the first one. And she publicly posted her grief on Instagram. And I remember reading through that and just crying. I mean, I think anybody who has an animal that they love, you could feel her pain. And I think, you know, there's such a shift. You see, um, you know, actors who whose wives have lost, you know, babies and they're writing about miscarriage and, you know, and they're being so honest about how they feel. And again, it, it, it humanizes who they are. And I think we can relate to that. And we're, we're so, we want that. We don't want the fake news and all the happy pictures as much because now we all realize it's fake, but it's so nice to see somebody who can be themselves, you know, and he can say, Hey, I messed up or, Hey, you know, I'm really sad today because I'm struggling with depression or, you know, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I lost my dog and, and I'm devastated. I don't know how I'm going to go forward. You know, it's like, now people are starting to express that in more human ways. And I think that's amazing. It really is. It's, it's going to develop. And the, 
I mean, the idea that everybody on the planet posts their Instagram picture or their Facebook and they want to get likes. I mean, you and I run businesses. And so we exist on social media space to let people know that our business is here and that we've got things that can help them and they can find out more. I mean, that's why I'm on these platforms. I have personal accounts on some of the platforms, but I don't have any time for them. <laughs> but it's it's really about just keeping up with what other people are doing. And I choose to follow my friends who I know in the real world. And you, know, you just kind of keep an idea of what they're up to and see what they're doing. But the reality of it is that most people's lives are pretty dull. <laughs> You're, right. You're right. You're right. You're not going to follow somebody's life if they're, you know, posting every hour when it's just a normal life. So there's going to have to be, the shift is going to have to come about how we, you know, how we use social media as it becomes more and more natural. Um, I think there's got to be benefits to that, haven't there? No, I think you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, it's the venue. It's like a it's like a living diary almost, but not sometimes with all the details. I mean, we we have people, I'm sure you know too, that, you know, post everything and it's kind of like, okay, I think I'll I'll take a break from that for a while. But I think, you know, if if they're having a tough time or if they had a bad day at work or whatever, I mean, it gives you the opportunity to be human and to reach out and say, you know, I'm here, you know, and I think that's all we want. Right. And if we can do it virtually, um, sometimes mm -hmm. that's yeah. I mean, sometimes that's especially with people because we're separated geographically. Um, it's so nice to be able to say, hey, you know, I'm sorry you had a crappy day at work. I did, too, or or whatever. Or, Here's a hug from California or, or whatever it is. And you feel, you know, you feel that love across the miles. And I think that really makes a difference in people's lives. As we move away from posting our best selves and move towards posting our true selves, then it becomes a much more um, feasible platform for real life work in terms of, you know, managing grief, in terms of, you know, getting people to connect with you on a, on a true, authentic, you know, human level. And I can't wait for that to become more prevalent. I think it'd be awesome. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, making my, my profile, my personal profile is private on Instagram for that reason. I mean, I don't want to be friends. It sounds bad. I want to be friends with everybody. I want to have my circle of friends. And, and I always caution people, you know, to really not only from a security perspective, but also from, you know, just from a, a human perspective is, you know, you have that group. And when you open it up to everybody, um, I don't know, it, it's, it's nicer to have those smaller groups of people in, in social media where you can be yourself and not be judged, analyzed and criticized, especially when it comes to things like grief and loss. Well, I think there's the whatever the number is. I think it's 500, isn't it? 500 is the maximum you know, social you know, number in terms of a social network that you can actually um, keep in touch with. And it might even be less. Right. So it could be 500. I don't know. But um. To, I mean, this is, I love these. I mean, for us, the track this week is an Avicii track, but it's, um, it's uh, what he'd be stoked with. It's a remix by uh, Nuni Bao and um, Nicky Romero, and it's called I Could Be The One, and it's just hauntingly beautiful. It's, it's an acoustic version. Um, and, you know, I mean, as the guy, you know, Matt, who the creator wrote in saying, you know, his playlist is called Music to Save the World, and it's brilliant. He has a superhero, and every week he sends in a track, and it's and it's it's a it's a it's a great read, you know, because there's the writing's great, but the music's great. But as you write, it's this time sometimes you just you know need to put saving the world to one side, and sometimes you just need to sit down and you know have a cry over somebody that you're gonna miss. Mm -hmm. So um, check out the track; um, it'll be below later on today. Um, the video will be up and out. Who knows? We even get clips from this session. Sharon is brilliant. I love doing these with you. Um, anything happening with Grief Reiki this week? This is a quiet week. This week's quiet week. We yeah. do have our Grief and Healing Corner tomorrow um, at 5.30, but uh, 5.30 Pacific time on Facebook Live. So that that's happening. 
Yeah, tell us more about that. Um, well, I created this after our talks for the last few months. Um, I, I really enjoy it as well, and thank you for always inviting me. Um, but I started my own grief and healing corner um, just to talk to people who are influencing, you know, the grief and healing communities and listen to their stories and talk a little bit about, you know, what their journey was like and what helped them to heal. And so we've been doing that every Tuesday. So I have one tomorrow, this Melody Nolan from Treasure Lives. Um, she's had quite a story that she's overcome and she started her own nonprofit to help with suicide prevention and um, healing as well. So um, we'll hear her story tomorrow at 5.30 Pacific time. Very cool. If you want to send us the link, um, we'll uh, stick that below. All right. All right, peoples, we'll see you next week. Um, take the Avicii track out for a spin. If you come across anybody who's grieving for that, um, for him, I mean, give him some love because this is a good thing. All right. Take care, Sharon. I'll see you soon.